Good morning, everybody. It's good to be back with you again. I think this is probably my fourth presentation, I think, at one of these meetings. So it's good to be back up here again, um, talking about my master's research now. Um, so heightened sensitivity in, in high grooming honeybees. Um, so what we're kind of looking at this is uh, looking at bees with uh, high versus low grooming behavior uh, and looking at uh, the potential mechanisms for, uh, for why some of those high grooming bees may be better, better able to both detect mites uh, on themselves and then take steps to remove mites from the colony. So I'll just uh, kind of jump right into it. Uh, not going to go too in depth uh, with Varroa. I know a lot of you guys know what Varroa is. A uh, couple things I do want to highlight though is that uh, Varroa was introduced to Apis mellifera from the Asian honeybee Apis serrana uh, sometime in the mid 20th century. Uh, and that Apis serrana has been able to develop uh, natural resistance behaviors uh, just because it's had the benefit of time to evolve alongside the mite. So it's been able to evolve certain resistance behaviors uh, and as such it is naturally resistant to the mite now. Uh, however, Apis mellifera is much more susceptible to Varroa and obviously we know it's, it's caused the deaths of millions of colonies worldwide. So the control of row destructor, as we know, typically we're, we're achieving control through chemical means. Um, so it raises a couple issues, one being the residues of, of chemicals being, being found in wax or honey products, uh, or potentially uh, the development of, of uh, chemically resistant mites. Uh, so there's a huge need for non-chemical means of control as well. Um, a couple of the more common ones involve uh, uh, trapping mites with drone brood, or using screen bottom boards with sticky traps. Uh, but probably the one with the most promise uh, um, for um, extended use and, and to de decrease our, our, our uh, use of chemicals uh, would be the development of mite resistant bees uh, through selective breeding. And so this involves uh, just capitalizing on the natural social immunity behaviors uh, in honeybees, uh, such as hygienic behavior or grooming behavior, uh, and then breeding bees with, with, those, with those traits. Uh, so I won't touch too much on hygienic behavior. I will just mention that uh, it, it has, uh, Dr. Spivak at the University of Minnesota has been able to uh, effectively breed a line of hygienic bees. Uh, but grooming behavior is maybe a, a little bit further back uh, on that breeding. Um, so there's more research uh, needed into grooming behavior. So when we talk about grooming behavior, uh, bees have the ability to groom themselves. Uh, they'll, they'll groom dust or pollen particles off themselves. Uh, but when we're talking about in relation to, um, uh, to Varroa mite, uh, we're talking about bees with a, with a heightened ability to remove those mites from their bodies. Uh, so bees can engage in auto-grooming, uh, which is self-grooming, um, uh, where they'll groom, groom the mites off themselves, or they can also engage in allo-grooming, uh, so grooming the mites uh, off the nestmates. Uh, and this can commonly be brought about by the grooming invitation dance, uh, which is kind of a tremble dance where the, the worker bee will stand there and, and tremble and, and release vibrations into the, into the honeycomb and attract other workers to come and <coughs> groom mites uh, off of her. So just to kind of summarize some of the other things we know about grooming behavior already, uh, we know it is one of the primary mechanisms of resistance in, in the Asian honeybee, Apis serrana. We know that uh, it does exist in Apis mellifera, but to a much lesser extent. Uh, although some studies have shown that uh, grooming behavior is, can be higher in some subspecies. Uh, so Africanized bees, uh, some Russian bees, and uh, Carniolan bees as well. Uh, we know that there's some level of communication or some group response, some group level response. So uh, the uh, uh, grooming invitation dance uh, can attract other bees, so there's some group response going on. And we know that it is a heritable trait, so it, it can be selected for. 
Uh, we also know that the current screening methods are quite slow and laborious, so really there's a, a quicker, a, a need for, for quicker screening methods uh, to, uh, to selectively breed for this trait. So some of the research gaps that we identified, so, so we know that some bees have a higher, higher level of grooming behavior, some bees don't have quite as high a level. Uh, so we wanted to know uh, why this is the case. So why are those bees better able to, to groom and, wh and why are some bees not uh, as able to uh, detect mites and to remove them from the colony? And so kind of the main theory we came up with is that, you know, maybe some of these bees are just more sensitive to stimuli uh, in, the, in the colony. And so the main research question we came up with is do high, high grooming bees have an overall heightened sensitivity to hive stimuli and or a heightened ability to communicate that sensitivity? So we came up with, with three, um, three main hypotheses. Uh, the first is that high grooming bees have a heightened sensitivity to varroa as well as a secondary uh, standardized stimulus. And so for my experiments, uh, we decided to use chalk dust as the secondary stimulus, uh, as it was shown in a previous experiment, to be able to solicit grooming responses. Uh, the second hypothesis was uh, that high grooming bees have enhanced sensitivity over different body regions. So looking at, it, is there different sensitivity from the head to the thorax to the abdomen, and where might this sensitivity be the greatest? And the third hypothesis uh, was that high grooming bees uh, exhibit increased communication either in the form of dances or potentially in the form of, sorry, uh, heat or sound. So looking at the experiments then. Um, first off, I'll just touch on uh, how we selected our colonies for this. So uh, I was able to use colonies from the Biomics project in 2016. So. Uh, I gave a presentation on Biomics last year, and just to recap, uh, what we're looking at with that project is developing uh, uh, markers for uh, economically important traits in honeybees, and so grooming behavior is one of those traits that we were looking at. Uh, so developing proteomic or genomic markers uh, for those traits. So grooming behavior was one of the traits that we were looking at, and, and we had 200 colonies on the U of M campus uh, in the 2016-2017 season. Uh, and so the grooming indicators we were looking at uh, with that project was the first one was the mite mortality rate, uh, which is kind of a measure of taking an estimate of how many mites are in the colony to begin with, and then using sticky boards to look at how many mites are falling down onto those sticky boards over a certain period of time. Uh, and then we were also collecting all those mites off those sticky boards and looking at all of them under a microscope and looking for any signs of mite damage, because uh, damage can also be associated with grooming behavior. So from there, uh, once, once that was all completed, uh, we selected the 15 highest and the 15 lowest uh, grooming colonies. So just to kind of quickly show you what our, our mite mortality rates kind of looked like. Uh, so these are our 15 highest on the left and then our 15 lowest on the right. So uh, this is the proportion of mites uh, falling to the bottom board after six days. So for the Biomix project, we started with uh, broodless splits, uh, roughly around 8,000 bees. So we were able to take take a sample of all those bees, uh, figure out what the percent mite infestation was, and then calculate roughly how many mites in total were in, that, in those colonies. And then we used sticky boards uh, for six days placed in the colony, and then counted all those mites and, and related that back. So this is the proportion of mites falling to those bottom boards. And then looking at the damaged mites as well, uh, this is a, an undamaged mite, and then this is kind of what a damaged mite looks like under the microscope. So we were able to also use that uh, as a method of selecting our colonies. So my first experiment uh, looked at the, the first two hypotheses, so kind of testing Varroa against uh, chalk dust, uh, and, and then testing just chalk dust over, over different regions of the body. So this occurred uh, last summer, 
2017. Uh, I took the 15 high and 15 low grooming colonies. From each of those colonies, I took uh, 125 live bees um, in, in a collection vial, brought those bees back to the lab, and then randomly distributed them to one of five treatment groups. So the first treatment group uh, was one live bee placed in a petri dish, uh, which received the addition of one live varroa mite. And then my second, third, and fourth treatment groups were my chalk dust treatment groups, uh, which received uh, a standardized puff of chalk dust either to the head, thorax, or abdomen. It was about uh, 0.5 or 0.4 milligrams of chalk dust. So just a nice small little puff. And then my, the fifth treatment group was a control, uh, no treat or no stimulus. So once all those uh, stimuli were applied to the bees in the petri dishes, we started a video camera, uh, recorded for three minutes, and then repeated that whole thing uh, 25 times for each colony. So 125 bees for each colony. So this is kind of just the setup uh, in the lab. Uh, this was in the flight room uh, where we do all our live bee research uh, in, the, in the bee lab. Uh, so adding the mites, we were able to collect live mites uh, using a CO2 shake and bring those live mites back to the lab and so this is just adding one, one mite to a bee there. And then the chalk dust was uh, applied with a pipette, so just a, just a little puff of chalk dust there. And so this is just a quick video of, <coughs> of one of those trials. Uh, so I have my control bee here, the bee with the mite here, uh, the, uh, the head, thorax, and abdomen bee here. And if we just uh, <coughs> zoom in on the control bee and the mite bee here, you can see the control bee is just kind of running around in the dish, whereas the bee with the mite is actively grooming. Uh, so this is what I'm going to be looking at, um, kind of where I'm at right now, is I haven't really had the time to go back and watch all these videos. Uh, Got married in the fall, and then I was on my honeymoon, and I have hundreds of hundreds of hours to go back and watch. So that's going to be fun. If anyone wants to volunteer to help me with that. Uh, so the second experiment, <coughs> I looked at again looking at the the first hypothesis, so testing varroa against chalk, uh, and then the the third hypothesis uh, that bees may uh, High groom bees may exhibit increased communication with dances, heat, or sound. So for that experiment, what did that look like? Uh, this time we had uh, nine high grooming and nine low grooming. We did lose a few colonies over the summer. Um, so from from those colonies, we took a uh, hundred. Actually, we took 250 bees divided into two uh, wooden cages. Brought those back to the lab. And to the first cage, we added uh, 20 live varroa mites. This time we added just a little, little dab of paint. Uh, we used a queen marker just to put a little dab of paint on them, just to kind of keep, keep a little bit better track of which bee we were actually adding the mite to. Uh, and then we added uh, 20, 20 small puffs of chalk dust uh, to all those bees in the chalk dust cage. Again, we recorded video. Uh, this time we recorded just kind of normal video. And we also recorded video uh, with an infrared camera that just attaches to an iPhone. So we had two video cameras on each cage. Uh, and then we uh, had kind of a high, high performance microphone uh, recording sound on those cages as well. So this is the setup for that experiment. So one microphone on each cage with uh, two video cameras there. And so this is just a, a quick video of what those look like. Um, there's one bee down here that I would like to highlight here. You can see that white dot with the mite on the, the, mite on the bee there, and that, that bee is actively grooming that. So, uh, And then I'm just about to add my 20th mite here. So it will be a little challenging to actually follow that bee. For, you're going to be following each, each of those bees for two minutes. and looking for uh, signs of, of auto-grooming or any signs of allo-grooming, any signs of uh, the grooming imitation dance, uh, and then analyzing uh, heat, and then um, hopefully I can just analyze those sound clips. Um, 
uh, Dr. Hare, who's on my committee, has said we can somehow just use the sound clips to kind of analyze if there's any differences in, in vibrations or any kind of buzzing differences or anything. So we'll see what happens. Um, with the heat responses, uh, this is <clears throat> maybe what we're going to find. Uh, this is from one of the high, high grooming colonies. Uh, so this is the heat uh, in that little cage uh, before any of the mites were added. Uh, so this is after five mites were added to the cage. So kind of bees are, looks like most of them are, are kind of lighting up a little bit, warming up their bodies. Um, and then after 15 minutes, there's quite a lot of heat being given off in there. So there may be some sort of heat responses going on there. Um, and this is kind of building on research um, that Suresh Desai was working on, unpublished research that he kind of noticed the same thing. And, and so we're trying to replicate that again. And, Maybe we'll see some sort of heat-related uh, responses for grooming as well. So just to kind of recap the significance of this research, uh, disease-resistant bees uh, have a great potential for long-term sustainable control uh, of Varroa, um, so we can have less reliance on chemical miticides. Uh, so clarifying some of these mechanisms of grooming behavior may help to reveal some novel selection methods for this behavior. Uh, and then we may be able to also relate uh, some of these results back to the results from the Biomics project, uh, which may help to maybe select uh, new, um, new markers or maybe just strengthen the ones that they've, they've, already, uh, they've already found. So that's kind of my research in a nutshell and uh, I have a lot of work to do yet, especially with the videos and then analyzing everything. So. Maybe by next year I'll have, I'll have some more results for you, but so that's, that's where I'm at, that's what I'm working on. So just like to uh, thank Dr. Curry and everyone on my committee, uh, Jason Gibbs, and uh, everyone for their technical assistance in the lab. So thanks a lot. <laughs> Try to answer any questions if you have them. Just one, how do you put paint onto a, how do you put paint onto a mite? <laughs> yeah, so we just, we had all the mites collected in a petri dish and just before I was going to use them, just had a queen marker, just put a little dab onto the mite. That's actually quite easy. Yeah. Steady hands, yeah. <laughs> they run around in there, eh? They, they run around a little bit, yeah, they're yeah. moving a little bit, but yeah, you can, you can get a dab on. Uh, you had a slide there with a healthy um, varroa and one that was destro destroyed, right? Do, when they groom those bees, do they actually kill it off too, or are they just, are they just taking them off, combing them out? Like how did that? That's a little up in the air. Uh, how how much uh, mite damage actually occurs uh, with grooming behavior? So that's why we kind of wanted to use uh, two two kind of methods of selection. So the mite mortality rate and the damage. Um, some studies have shown like claim that that damage does quite often happen, but some studies are a little less, um, they don't think that as much as other studies, but yeah. So if they groom it off, then they could potentially climb back on another one, correct? Yeah, that's true, yeah, yeah, you could, they could groom it off and then... So in part of your studies, are you looking also for that, how, what, what percentage are actually being groomed off and destroyed or, or what? Um, not so much with this study, um, yeah, more just kind of looking at the behaviors of the bees and their sensitivities, so, yeah. One more, back. I'm just curious on what kind of temperatures you were seeing, or have you analyzed that yet as far as when those bees heated up? Because we've noticed in hot summers our mite load is usually lower in the fall, after a real hot summer, and I know that mites are, are more sensitive to heat than bees are. They can, bees can tolerate a higher temperature, so it'd be interesting to see just how hot those bees. Yeah, I haven't, unfortunately, I haven't done any of the analysis on the sure. heat there yet, so um, yeah, that'll be really interesting once, once I have that. Thanks a lot.